Hello, thank you for inviting me back once again to share some more information on textiles, on Mexican textiles. I've entitled this presentation, Mesoamerican Textiles, a Millennial and Centennial Tradition. I, it's basically an introduction to the history of, of Mexican textiles. And um, the, one of the very important things is that there is a whole technology and there are raw materials. And for most of the indigenous groups of, of Mexico, the knowledge of, of uh, textiles, the knowledge of weaving and, and embroidering is a sacred gift of the goddesses and the virgins. The goddesses were pre-Hispanic as, as this image to the left shows as a Mayan woman and to the right, is the the virgin that is when the uh, Spaniards came and evangelization took place the imposition of the Catholic religion the ancient goddesses were substituted by the Christian virgins and it is still considered a sacred gift so it's like mother like daughter it's it's a wonderful system of knowledge of intangibles and tangibles, and, and we'll look it over. For instance, among the Maya, it's more than a millennial, 1,000 or more years of the tradition. We have a woman sitting, a, a figure sitting at a, pre, at a, a backstrap loom. We have a ritual huipil. We, we'll learn a little bit about what a huipil is. And then we have the drawing from a pre-Hispanic dintel, a, a stone cut, where we can see a similar huipil being worn by a woman, by a lady shock, by a, a, an authority of the, of the Mayas of Yaschilan through a bloodletting ritual. So there is a continuity, even though there are some changes, there is a continuity of at least 1,000, 1,500 years in these textiles. Here we can see that uh, the backstrap loom is the basic technology, and there are different materials that are used at a given moment. They can be agave fibers, they can be cotton, basically are the, the two fibers that were native to Mexico. The Spaniards brought wool, it isn't like South America where they had llamas and alpacas, those that do not exist in this territory. So wool was substituted by feathers and by rabbit hair, curiously enough. Uh, and here we can see the different parts of the loom, that uh, the different parts of the technology that constitute a whole system. And this is what was being used when the Spaniards arrived. I, I won't go into great detail. Um, cotton was a commodity. The, the Aztec empire exacted tribute. They would send their, their spies to different parts of what is now Mexico, Mesoamerica, and they would see what was grown, what was the most important produce and they would exact it as tribute when they conquered the people. So when they conquered territories, they did not kill. What they did was they came to agreements so that they would be working for them and uh, sending the tribute to central Mexico, to what is now the Valley of Mexico. And so we have white cotton to the left, we have brown cotton in the middle, and those little bags with little red points are cochineal, cochineal as the most important dye after, before the conquest and after the conquest too. Here we see some of the sheets, some of the sheets of the tribute and from uh, cotton to cloth, they would have to weave and, and uh, embroidery was not known. We haven't found very much embroidery in, in uh, the very few pre-Hispanic evidence that there is of textiles, that we don't have the same climate that the coast of Peru does where thousands and thousands of, of mortuary bundles have been found. And so bits and pieces of textiles 
come out in caves, in dry caves or, or in bogs, no? So this gives us an idea of how complex and beautiful the textiles were that were also a part of the tribute in the 16th century, the 15, just before the conquest that took place in 1521. Maguey, which is an agave fiber, uses, they use the whole part, all, all of the parts of the plant, even the insects that grow on the bottom or on the top of it. And one of the basic uh, garments is called an ayate, it's a square piece. And here we find, for instance, well, here we can see where men and women spin and they can walk because it's a long fiber. Then the next step is spinning and spinning cotton is more difficult than, than ixled, which is the fiber extracted from the maguey. And they have to be sitting down and they have to prepare the cotton in order to spin it. It, it was on the brink of extinction, but it is coming back slowly with very special textiles, mostly for sale, not so much for use. It's a, a costly process. Then you have to warp, you have to prepare the, the threads for your warp, which are the vertical threads, to prepare them to set up on the loom. And this is the loom, it's called a backstrap loom or a waist loom, and it is truly a, a masterpiece of applied, applied technology because one end, the top end goes around a tree and the, or, a, or a post and the bottom end goes around the woman's waist. And it is her waist which uh, allows for her to open and close the shed and pass the, the uh, shuttle to, to make the cloth. This gives us an idea of men's clothing during the pre-Hispanic period, the basic clothing was what they call the loincloth, which would be at the top here. This would be the basic clothing. Then there could be a, a little skirt-like piece. And the other basic clothing would be the, the men's shawl that they would wear um, over the shoulder or in front. The other, the, the here we get an idea of other clothing for rituals, for war, for games. And the women's basic clothing would be either a short skirt or a long skirt without any, with uh, just the rectangular pieces and a woman's um, cloak. And then we also have what is called the keshkemital, which would be a triangular, or, or parallelopid uh, cape that goes on top of the body. Here we have two examples of a, this would be a wipil on the left and a keshkemital on the right. And what is amazing is how they are still in use today, 500 years after the conquest and over a thousand years since these figures were, these, uh, in this case, these, clay figures were made. And here we can see how a kashkemital is constructed. There are three different forms of constructing it. This one is the most common where you have two rectangular pieces that are going to meet at, at a 90 degree angle to form the, the uh, cape. And this would be two pieces of cloth that are joined. This is used very little. And then here we have the same idea as type three is similar to type two. And we, um, we, we get the same effect. However, it's joined in a different way. So that's the Keshkemital. Then we have the Weepil. We have many different kinds of Weepil. A Weepil is, as you can notice, it is a tunic-like garment and there can, it can be one web, it can be three web, two webs with different lengths, different kinds of neck openings, three web, the same thing. It can be round, it can be v-neck, it can be square. And all of these are called weepil and they're very specific to an indigenous region and an indigenous group. There, it isn't like uh, anyone can wear it. 
here we see it a little bit with with the designs. No, these these would be all of the parts that are that are dark would be designs that are mostly woven in. Excuse me, woven in, and um, with very complex designs. Here we have the skirts, the wraparound skirt, which has no uh, sewing, is held up by a sash. And what makes it different, what gives it its identity is the way it, it's folded. And it has to be folded before you put the, the um, sash on so that a woman can walk. You don't just wrap it around tightly, otherwise you can't. You take a step. So this is also an element of identity. What you're seeing here is just the top of the wraparound skirt. And you have to imagine it as having two or three uh, rectangles that, that are sewn together on the, on the horizontal part of the uh, making the garment. The other thing that's very important are the natural dyes. This is a, a very important skirt, a wraparound skirt of an enredo from the coast of Oaxaca, the state of Oaxaca. And it is spectacular because it has cochineal dyed silk, purpura, the, the purpura uh, snail from the ocean that lives on the rocks, and indigo. So you've got three wonderful dyes being used in, the, in one skirt. However, I have been working for 37 years on the protection of purpura, of the, of the snail, because it has been under tremendous duress for its survival. Of the few um, extant indications of natural dyes, here we have a, a drawing of a, an archaeological three web. You can see here are the, the sewn parts where it's got painted, probably purpura dye and a batik technique. And this was this is a pro, this is the beginning of the 16th century. And then these two to the left are part of the tribute cloths, and you can see the bright red and the yellow and and the indigo blue. And then on the right you have another codice of one of the few pre-Hispanic codices. 1450 is the approximate date. And it's from the coast of Oaxaca, and you can see the purple probably representing the, the purpura dye, and also as body paint. And one of the projects we have, this is called the Nutal Codice, it's, it's in the British Museum and the British Library, is to have it examined to see if it actually has the dye or if, it, if another color was used to, to depict. So going, coming back to these three fabulous dyes, first we have the insect, which is the cochineal that grows on the, on the prickly pear plant. We have indigo that has to be processed. It's a plant and it has to be processed. And we have the purpura where each one of, the, of each snail has to be milked. One of the amazing things that we discovered was that the indigenous, the Mistec Indians of Oaxaca had a thousand year old knowledge and what we would call now a thousand year old resource management plan because they knew the cycle or they know the cycle because they still do. And they only die during certain periods, only use certain sizes and are very careful and they know they can milk it. They don't have to kill it. Here we can see the plant for indigo, the prickly pear and the, the description of the male and the female cochineal and the mistake descriptions of, of all of the parts of the male and the female of purpura. And these are um, very representative. Well, Sorry, we're repeating. Here we can see a um, how they go to the ocean and they're on the rock. The, the purpura lives precisely above where the ocean 
the ocean uh, hits the, the, the rocks, it lives on the rocks. Then we have other dyes. We have this beautiful weepy done with natural dyes. This was a revival project, and this is one of the dyes. We have also a revival of uh, the use of feathers naturally dyed on wool, for in, you know, as an example. We have an, an, another palette of color. We have indigo, we have yellows, we have greens coming from the combination of blue and, and yellow, and we have cochineal also. This is a natural dye that is, a, it grows on trees. It's a, um, it's a, well, if they, if they leave it on the tree, it'll strangle it. It's a, like a, however, it gives a beautiful yellow. You can see this beautiful yellow. Many flowers, many, many flowers. However, I have always contended that natural is not equal to sustainable and have, have been rallying and making a point to the dyers and the weavers and embroiders that we have to know what the resource is, we have to understand how its reproductive cycle is so that we don't go out and collect flowers and then the next season there aren't any flowers or trees or shrubs. Of course, trees are the most delicate of all because most of them are, are in the wild. So we have to be very careful. Here we find different ways of weaving techniques on the loom. These are all loom techniques. And this is for this is for sashes. They call it um, um, warp warp brocade. This would be uh, brocade, which is adding adding warp patterning. Excuse me. This is warp patterning. This would be brocade, which is the most common of all of the techniques. This would be gauze weave, where you you um, twist the warps and then have a weft go through and it's a very lacy looking kind of a textile. This would be one of the very complex techniques for Keshkemitals, which is making a curve that has almost had almost died out and has recently been revived. And this would be tapestry weave, which is used for, for certain garments. Um, and these are all tapestries, this would be what we call a twill, where you can see a, a uh, lineal lines that, that come on the clothing. Here are examples, for instance, this would be the wraparound skirt, different proportions, and this would be a weepy with a, a indigo background, and then natural brown cotton, natural white cotton and purpura. And all of these designs are have meanings. The double-headed eagle is part of a creation myth of how the sun and the moon came about. These are usually called fish ribs. Um, this would be an inverted S. And these would be also a, a uh, reference to birds or to feathers. Here we find a procession. We find different examples of brocading, which is weaving as you, you weave the designs in as you go along and they can be uh, mistaken for embroidery sometimes, but they're not. Here you can see how, how the, the pickup stick takes the, the ones that are going to pass. Here you can see how they're passing the weft after you've taken the pickup stick to create these very complex, beautiful designs, very laborious. Here, somebody is doing gauze and brocade. You can see very lace-like, it is not drawn thread. These are done on the loom by twisting the wefts. Here we can see an, a combination of, bro, of a, of the um, brocading together, the brocading together with the gauze. And so you've got a very uh, light and thick 
uh, over the shoulders and a combination of textures, and this would be a kishkemetal, that has practically died out, which is one of the problems. Here we have the, the technique that is also in danger of, of uh, dying out, the rounded, the round on the loom with embroidery and also with brocading. And uh, this would be examples of the um, twill, a lot of it on wool, wedding, wedding outfits that have changed a lot, double weave, you can see it's front and left, positive, negative. The sashes with their with the pat weft warp patterning, some other examples, beautiful ways of of uh, trimming trimming the 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 various um, uh, the three webs, and then they they use these fancy trims so that you don't see the actual things. And so we have things that are for uh, clothing that's for every day and clothing that is for fiestas, for, for rituals, no? Such as this example where I did my original field work in the early 70s, the, the Mayan uh, community of Magdalenas. Here we have it again. Um, silk was also brought in by the Europeans, although there's more and more evidence that there was a local silk, not a mulberry bush silk, and also the scissors and, and uh, metal, metal needles were brought in, as was embroidery, all of these various techniques of embroidery. And this would be a, a, a Spanish peasant blouse from, this, from the time of contact. Here we can see how the men's clothing, the uh, costume change from the loincloth and the tilma or, or cloak, and it was changed for something that would cover them up. The Spaniards were, were not into naked, practically naked bodies. And so we see through the 16th, 17th centuries how the different clothing evolved around what were called the caste because we had African slaves brought in and we had a lot of contact with Asia through the Manila Galleon. So it was a very complex society and many different kinds of clothing came up here. We can see beautiful things done with cross stitch embroidery. This would be the Huichols, the Huichol men's tunic, which was brought in by the Spaniards or, or women's blouses, a kishkemetal. So we have a, pre a kishkemetal that is pre-Hispanic made out of wool, that the material is brought in and then embroidered. So it really is a, a wonderful uh, amalgama, a wonderful meshing of traditions, no? More embroidery all over a wipi-like uh, pre-Hispanic original cloth, another technique, a long, a long arm cross stitch, the back stitch, the, this for instance, these have become very famous, these embroidered um, cloth called from Tenango de Doria. In fact, it's one of the best examples of uh, a technique and a style that is being uh, copied and used in different places in the, throughout the world, printed or sent to India or China to be copied at a fraction of the cost. And this would bring me to one of the points that I want to make, which is um, what is being considered the a, a big problem among the weavers and embroiderers of Mexico, which is certain companies just taking the designs and not worrying whether or not they are harming, not even war, uh, considering a payback. And many of the arguments are, well, if they're not patented, if these designs are not protected, they're, they're uh, out, they're free. And so there have been a series of uh, initiatives, of legal initiatives 
here in Mexico to protect the textiles, the designs, and it is a complex road to do this protection. The idea, there are two roads, I think two, two ways of doing it. One is through all of the international treaties and trying to bring these textiles to be protected. What is the major problem? That they don't belong to a, a person. These are collective creative, they're the product of creative collective processes. And yes, there are individual uh, possibilities of, of uh, expression. However, on the whole, they are identifiable. We know that these these on the bottom are animals with a certain kind of distribution of design and and a um, different colors. They can be one a solid color, different, but they're very identifiable. And this is the most copied textile of Mexico. It is actually not traditional. It's not very old. It's a, it was developed in the 50s, 60s. They used to do cross stitch. And the other road, one road, as I say, is looking for all of the legal and, in, and creating new international laws that will respect and ask permission of the people to use the, their designs and to come to written agreements. And then I have been a part of a, of a, of a civil society group that is saying, why don't we try to work as the laws are passed and, and all of those things are, are, all of the legalities are done, why don't we invite the designers or the, the big companies and the communities to come together and draw up agreements? What, what we're looking for is recognition. Recognition and identify, of identity and of creativity. Because once you copy it, once you take, you know, you scan it and you reproduce it, well, it's not going to be as creative as the real textile is. And so something, there should be a give back and there should be transparency in how the, the, the chain of value is created. And so that is one of the projects that, that we're working on. We're trying to work on what we would call a, a circle of plenty and not a, a, a maelstrom, not something that pulls down, but rather something that comes up. And I think that is one, at this point, is one of the challenges that is facing the beauty of ethnic around the world and it comes into conflict with an attitude from the, the uh, fashion world and textile world that it's out there to be used freely. Well, I think that we should all think of how do the people who make it live? And what is their livelihood? And what are their options and alternatives? And we should be uh, building and constructing agreements so that everybody can benefit from it. And this is what I would like to talk about to you today.